Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian, episode number 36. Now this episode is the other half of uh, my favorite Star Wars podcast out there, Sky Talkers, Caitlin Plesher. Now Caitlin is, unsurprisingly, very, very interesting. She uh, She's going to school for historical preservation, which is way cooler than you'd probably expect. Um, we break that down, and it's it's so cool and so important, and I'm really excited to share this uh, this this show. And I was really happy to talk to her because this was the first time we've had like a full on conversation, and she's great. Um, I make her s- almost spit her drink out twice, which is now a point of pride on this show because uh, that's awesome. But we talk about all kinds of stuff: traveling. Um, she's been to Hawaii and Iceland. We talk about the Greatest Showman because I've been obsessed with that movie lately. Um, it's really good. You should go see it. Bring tissues. You'll probably cry. Or maybe not. I might just be overly sensitive when I'm watching movies. Um, but we obviously, we get into Star Wars at the end because you can't have a host of Sky Talkers podcast and not talk Star Wars. And that's great. Um, I do have to put a disclaimer here. Uh, I was so into the conversation that my recorder stopped for a couple minutes and I didn't notice so you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll probably notice, but there's a point where you'll hear like a, a little sound effect and that's where it happened. And then it just kept on going, but it's really quick. Um, you know what? You're going to be so into what we're talking about. You're not even going to remember by the end of it. Uh, so I'm so sorry that that happened. It's, uh, you were just too captivating, Caitlin. But anyway, without further ado, here is the interesting podcast episode number 36 with Caitlin Plesher. Theme song time. Charlotte said she had such a great time when she was on. And I was like, I knew you would. We all did. Now I want to be on too. <laughs> That's right. I'm slowly like uh, just getting my name around. I'm like, hey, why don't you come on? And then everyone else is like, I, I need to do that. I'm like, yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in- it's I'm working. S- That's right. I'm just slowly infesting the internet via Twitter. <laughs> hey, if it works, it works. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. How are you? I am doing pretty good. It's it's a bit of a rainy day here in Georgia, but it's not too cold. So we had a bit of a cold snap last week, so it's cool. warming up a little bit. Tell me about it. My blood's thinned out since moving to Florida, and uh, <laughs> my God, this last week I thought I was going to die. Yeah, because it was, it was really cold. It's there. so cold. It got to, so I mean, I'm going to sound like a wimp here for anyone who lives anywhere north of Florida, <laughs> but it was like 36 degrees, and I was okay, like- that's- I can't That's really my cold for Florida. Right? Thank you. It snowed yeah. in Tallahassee, and I was like, the apocalypse starts now. <laughs> it was nuts. Yeah. It was, I was, I love winter. I'm, I'm a big winter fan. I hate summer. I hate being hot and sweaty and sticky. I'm just, I'm not into it. Fair. So I actually really like the cold weather. Um, but it was, Georgia just like flip flopped so much. Like it was 20 degrees Monday. Cool. That was like the high or something. And then oh. today it was 60. And it just, it goes back and forth so much. And I just, you know, it's winter. I would like it to be winter and stay winter. And then we can move into spring and it'll be fine. But give me my winter months. That's right. It's like one of those things where you leave the house in the morning and you've got like a hoodie and you're dressed for it. But by lunch, you're like having to take half of it off. Like, it's the worst. Going on? It's the worst. I mean, I guess that's the good thing about Florida is it's fairly consistent except for these weird bouts of snow in Tallahassee. <laughs> yes. It's always hot here. Yes. <laughs> Humidity is a thousand percent. Mm-hmm. But, oh, yeah. But when the second it hits like 60, everyone's in hoodies. <laughs> <laughs> it hits 50, we're in gloves in preparing for the winter. The thing is, do you even have gloves? Do people even sell gloves down no. in Florida? No, they That's don't. <laughs> That's just it. I think I, I have like, I really like jackets. I just think jackets mm-hmm. are cool. I have so many cool jackets that I never get to wear. 
because I'm like, you just have oh, this to do fun. like winter time traveling. That's the thing. You're right. You're exactly right. Look at that. We've already solved the problem. I try. I try. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Georgia are you in? I, uh, well, right now I'm in school in Athens, Georgia, the University of Georgia. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a great town. Athens. I've been through there. And you have. I yeah. Have. I love Athens. It's a, I tell people it's like the it's like the stereotypical college town, like what you imagine. Like it's perfect for a movie, a college town. Like sure. whatever you're picturing in your head, that's what Athens is um, in the best way possible. I mean, I, I love this. This little, our little town. It's great. My brother uh, went to basic training at Fort Benning in Georgia, mm -hmm. and I spent like two days in Covington. Yeah. I love Covington. It's so it, nice. You know, I've never been there, but I've heard great things. There's like so many movies that are filmed there, mm -hmm. and when you they have like a, a like a town square almost, and around sidewalk around the park, it's like their own walk of fame with stars of <laughs> actors and stuff. Oh really? Yeah, I didn't know that. You should go. It's like I mean, Vampire Diaries was filmed there, and I was okay, pretty, I was pretty into that show for a while. That's what I was going to say, Vampire Diaries, because I know my sister was a big Vampire Diaries fan, and her and her friends always wanted to go. I was like, I think it was Covington where they always wanted to go, but it was. Yep, it was. There's like three or four of the characters' homes are in Covington. You could just go around the street and be like, there's that house, and there's this house. It's my pretty gosh. cool. I know. My uncle one time had lunch with Paul Wesley. What? That was, yeah. So Paul Wesley was... My uncle's friend was is like this really wealthy guy. He had like this really great job and owned this fantastic apartment in Atlanta. And my uncle's friend was moving to Paris or China, somewhere exotic for his job. Mm -hmm. And um, Paul Wesley like rented out this guy's apartment, my uncle's friend. And so this friend had my uncle like basically be like check up on the house and make sure Paul Wesley, if Paul Wesley needed anything. And like my uncle kept the spare key. And so they all had lunch together to like just meet each other so that Paul Wesley would know who my uncle was if he ever needed like an extra key or something like that. What? So that's awesome. Yeah. That, yeah. It was pretty cool. Um, but that it. was the, it was a one time thing and they never saw each other again. <laughs> hey, it only takes one time to make the story. Exactly. And there you go. So I hope it was interesting enough. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if, see, if I was your uncle, I would be crazy about it and be like, listen, I've got the key to Paul Wesley's home. I mean, we can say we're <laughs> friends. I mean, we're definitely friends. Like, we're best friends. We had lunch yesterday. Yeah, I know. That's what we tried to get him to do all the time. But for some reason, he didn't. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> you just have to translate it. Be like, my uncle is like best friends with Paul Wesley. So yeah. much so, he has the key to his home. <laughs> yeah, just exaggerate it. I That's mean, right. That's and fun. I'll pretend that it was, like, last week instead of, you know, some six years ago or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> Hollywood is all lies anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like lying about your age, but oh my how God. long that... ago you met someone. I had I have an agent in uh, on the other coast. I'm not going to name names. But I will say <laughs> that I got this email from her saying that, like, uh, there was this Swiss grocery store that was filming a commercial in Miami. And it's like, yeah, the director looked at your headshot and, like, specifically asked for you. And, like, if Ooh. you wanted to make the drive, I'm like, oh, sweet. Yeah, I'll drive an hour and a half to do a commercial for a grocery store in Sweden because why not? Yeah, and absolutely. When I got over there, I was one of 50 people. And it was at, like, a faux TED Talk-like setting. And the camera was behind me. And I was <gasps> like, I'm pretty sure the casting director didn't specifically ask for me if I'm one of 50 people and you're seeing the back of my head. <laughs> but but it got you there and it made you feel really good <laughs> it did it did up until they're like okay you can go home now it's like wait we're not done <laughs> wait, you haven't seen my face yet what? yes what? Ex <laughs> hold up where did this Where's my where close did, up yes where did this request come from <laughs> <laughs> i didn't send in pictures of the back of my head <laughs> <laughs> that was the day i learned that was the day i learned yeah oh gosh that's cool so you're not you're not from athens correct I'm not. I'm from I'm from the Atlanta suburbs area. So a town called Johns Creek. Cool. It's it's a it's suburban. That's mm -hmm. the best way to describe it. <laughs> gotcha. Not a giant city like Atlanta. No, I mean it's pretty big. Um, but yeah, it's about forty five minutes north of Atlanta. Okay. That's a good place. Can't complain. Sure. What was that like growing up in Georgia? I mean it it's been it was great. Um 
Yeah, I was born in Atlanta. We lived in Lawrenceville when I was really little, and then we moved to the Johns Creek area when I was five, and we've been there ever since. Um, So, yeah, you know, it's great. My my first, my elementary school was, like, just down the road from my neighborhood, so it was really nice, actually. Um, I was really fortunate with the the setting I grew up with. Um, I wish it had been a little more very just because it was so like so suburban again it's like you Mm -hmm. think of what a suburban neighborhood should look like in your head and that's that's where I grew up (laughs) (laughs) which is great um but yeah I I think it would have been fun too to grow up in a place like Athens that is just is so different and like so steeped in history because that that's what I'm really interested in and what I'm studying so it would have been fun to grow up in that kind of environment as well sure have you ever been to Stone Mountain Yes, of course. <laughs> I, had to. I have to ask the basic questions in the front. Yeah, yeah, of course. We used to go all the time. Um, when I was really young, before we moved to Johns Creek, we lived really close to Stone Mountain. So we would go in the summertime all all the time. And you bring dinner, and you get you have a picnic blanket, and you watch the laser show. It's a rite of passage. Of course. It's so cool. Yeah, you've been? I have. I think it was my senior year in high school. My band trip was to Georgia. Oh, okay. We went to Atlanta. We did Six Flags, and Very we did uh, Stone Mountain, and uh, it started snowing while we were at Six Flags. And oh wow! There's a picture of me somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I'm just like really, really mad because I don't <laughs> like the cold. And like, there's a bunch of people that like were born and raised in Florida and had never seen snow, so they're like oh, cool. in the background of the picture, like freaking out. They're just oh my god, this is amazing, and I'm just really, really mad, like staring at a snowflake on my sleeve. It's like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Um, there is that SNL skit from when Atlanta shut down a couple years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, they called it the Devil's Dandruff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's exactly what it is. It's really Snow. funny. Snow yeah. is but... snow's pretty in pictures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it can stay there. <laughs> uh, see, I love it. I want it here all the time. I want. I want a snowy. I want a snowy Christmas. Sure. We had this past Christmas actually was the first time I've seen snow like around Christmas time. We we're when it snowed a couple like just before Christmas and we were doing a dinner with my family in Atlanta and it was snowing and it snowed a lot too. Sure. I was like I've never actually listened to Christmas music while it's snowing because usually if Georgia gets snow, it's going to be in January or February. Right, right. Did it snow like a lot, a lot? Because I've seen pictures it, and it like it did. Everywhere. I mean. For Georgia yeah, standards, but it, it was at least, I mean, I want to say it was at least eight to nine inches. It was a good, a good chunk of snow. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it was beautiful. I remember I was like, I'm sitting by a Christmas tree and drinking hot cocoa and listening to Christmas songs. And this is what Christmas should be. There you go. Enhance yeah. the experience for yourself. Mm-hmm. It was great. I loved it. When I read the first Game of Thrones book, it was like one of those years where it was kind of cold for like a week in Florida. And I remember, mm-hmm. I was like, no, 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 I got to use this. And I took a chair, put it outside, started reading, and like it was cold. <laughs> so while I'm reading about like North of the Wall, I'm like, ooh, I'm cold too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like method acting. Method. Yeah, you got you to gotta <laughs> put yourself in that situation. It's snowing. You know what we need? Christmas music. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Feed the aesthetic. It, it, you know, North Carolina, when it snows, it's not like, a, like, like inland, you know, where you get like feet of snow. It's like a snow that's really light and wet and like kind of muddy it's not it's not great but i remember we had a trampoline on the farm i lived on and it like the the whole trampoline section was just covered in ice so we would sit on it and then just kind of fall off it (laughs) (laughs) like without doing anything but that's funny we had a trampoline too growing up and i remember when it would snow it was always fun to jump on the trampoline with all of the snow and then watch it like seep out of the bottom of the trampoline yeah of course trampolines are the best they are yeah we had a i remember we had one in our backyard in florida and it was like underneath like a banyan tree and like in Mm -hmm. the woods sort of thing and my brother took like uh christmas lights and put them in the tree so at nighttime, it was like this trampoline area where we could hang out, and there's just Christmas lights everywhere, and it just looked really cool. 
That is really cool. Right? I'm into that. Right? We had we had a our trip, and so I grew up. My house is on the Chattahoochee River, cool. so we're actually like surrounded by woods. Um, Love and it. I remember one of my best friends and I one time decided we were going to spend the night on the, on the trampoline in the summertime. Nice. Yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> in <laughs> <but> we're, theory, <laughs> we're sleeping in the middle of the trampoline. You don't think about things like dew in the morning, um, uh. but we 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 must have been like eight or nine, and we start hearing this hissing sound coming from underneath us and we both immediately wake up completely freaked out and we're like what what is going on like we're we're so scared and it turns out it's the sprinklers turning on early in the morning and it made that like hissing sound but we both were certain it was a snake and uh (laughs) once we realized it was the sprinklers but we were of course very relieved but then we the sprinklers were on, so then we had to go inside. <laughs> of course. Hey, you made it through the night. That's a, that's an accomplishment. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I, I wish I could remember if we actually like slept comfortably on the trampoline. I remember that waking up in, in a panic. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a snake under there because that's how they yeah. sound. <laughs> I would just freak out. I'm terrified of snakes. It's like, yeah, no. it's like my one fear in life, snakes. Yeah. Y- you know, Indiana Jones, not a bad fear to have. That's exactly what I tell myself. Mm-hmm. I was like, you yep. know what? I can still be manly and, and be terrified of snakes. Look at Indiana Jones. Yeah, I mean, Harrison Ford. Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, look, you're like, fine. <laughs> if I get stuck in a room with a cobra, I'm going to kill myself before it gets to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is just I, how it's going to go down. I Yeah, snakes aren't my favorite. Um, I remember we had to do this emergency preparedness project in middle school once. And apparently, like, a lot of number of species of snakes live in Georgia. Yeah. Like, almost all of them <laughs> in some version. And, like, spiders, too. It's like mm-hmm. Georgia's just a catch-all for every scary creature. Sure. Georgia's the uh, Australia of America. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm so glad you were drinking when I said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works perfectly. Yeah, thank you. That'll yeah. be a good sound bite. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So you travel a lot, too. I do. I try to. Um, I, I like traveling a lot. It's it's fun. I got to travel a lot last year, actually, just kind of going across the United States. I didn't get to do any international travel last year, but sure. around, around you, the U.S. What did you see here? I went to, well, now I'm not going to be able to remember. Um, I did <laughs> a weekend in Charleston with Pretty. my... Yeah, I've never been actually, so that was really fun. So my my program at school, we all went to to Charleston for a couple of days, which is really nice. Went to Boston to see Charlotte, cool. um, and oh, I was up in I was in upstate New York actually for the whole summer at an internship, which you're basically in Canada. I did do international travel actually. I went to Boom. Canada. Boom. Uh, yeah, so my internship was actually right on the border of Canada and the U.S., so that was really fun and. I've never been that far up north before, so that was really great. Sure. And and Florida, I went to Florida. My parents have a house in Florida, so I was down there a couple times. Cool. So it was fun. Celebration. Celebration yeah, was yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. Yep, in Orlando. Yeah, I can't forget celebration. Yeah. So. Have you been, uh, how far west have you been in the U.S.? I have not been that far west. I have family out in Nebraska, and that's about as far west as I, well, no, that's a lie. I've been to Hawaii. Uh, when I was younger, what? when I was about 12. Yeah. Do you remember it? Yeah, I do. It was it was a family vacation. It was kind of this, like, celebration before my sister went to college. It was mm-hmm. when she had graduated. So we did this, like, last family hurrah in uh, Hawaii. And it actually <laughs> has a lot of, like, bad memories that are really funny oh, now no. looking back at them. Um, like, our... Our plane between islands got delayed, and we had to wait, like, hours for this five-minute flight. We were on a dinner cruise, and the ship broke down, and so we were stranded on this boat for hours. Do you know what the road to Hana is? I'm about to. (laughs) The road to (laughs) Hana. I I wish you had asked Charlotte about the road to Hana. um, That's why I have you on. It's <laughs> the road to Hana is this road trip that takes about six hours to the top of this mountain. And wow. basically you drive up and then you drive back down. And there are like pit stops along the way of things you can stop and look at, like different waterfalls and, and vistas and things like that. 
And it was, we had this CD that would tell you where to stop. This is like 2005 or something. Oh. And every track on the CD started with Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> every single track, like 50 tracks. Of, and my father is such a, a landscape guy that we stopped at every single pit stop. <laughs> and it was. I remember we got to the top and there, there's nothing there. There's nothing in Hana. It's like a general store. Oh, <laughs> and then you drive back down. And for years I have told Charlotte this horrible story of how awful Hana was. And it's like something we all <laughs> laugh about now. And then she went to Hana and it was like this great trip with her and her family. <laughs> what? Did she have and the I, tape? No, no. Cause well, of course they went like, two years ago. So they had like, I don't know. They threw away the Aloha girl. Aloha <laughs> girl. They I had just, actual people. Yeah, I just remember being like, it took it took longer to get to Hana than it did to get to my grandparents' house in Florida, and we didn't even go anywhere. Oh no! And I was <laughs> it was so long. <laughs> that is nuts. I've always wanted to go to Hawaii because I feel like it's so, I mean, literally detached from the mainland. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but like, it seems like it's its own planet. Like, there's volcanoes there and, like, sea turtles and there's whales and nut stuff just everywhere. I don't know. It just seems kind of cool. Yeah. No, it's great. I'd love to go back. My dad's going in a, in a couple months or so on, like, a guy's trip. And I'm like, what do you mean a guy's trip? What about me? <laughs> I reject this. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you see anything cool in Hawaii as far as, like, wildlife goes? Because I just feel like it's this it's this promised land. Of just um, animals. You know, I don't remember. We did a helicopter tour uh, where we, like, flew over the waterfalls and stuff, and that was really cool. And uh, my dad and I, I was really into astronomy at the time, and so our hotel had this, like, astronomy class or something that you took at night, and you did it on the rooftop. What? And they had one of those, like, huge telescopes that they, like, one of those really big ones. Yeah. And or we did that one night. That was really fun. Um, I don't remember a lot of wildlife, though. Actually, now that I now that you asked the question, that makes sense. Most things I build up in my head aren't real. But so, <laughs> so you went on a helicopter ride. I did a yeah. helicopter ride when I was in Los Angeles. And Ooh. tell me if it worked the same with you. But did it seem like you were constantly going like up, 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 and then down, and then up, and then down, and like not smooth? I think I think so. I remember the pilot turning a lot mm -hmm. because he knew it freaked my sister out, and so he uh. would do it to just kind of mess with her. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, I feel like Hawaiians been... are that laid back. <laughs> yeah, that must have been really fun though. Did they go over like the Hollywood sign and everything? Uh, we thought they were supposed to. <laughs> they went around like downtown. We saw skyscrapers, and then went. We could see it in the distance, but we didn't go like right over it. But I was mm -hmm. like, I mean, in movies, when you see a helicopter, you think it's just going to be like a smooth ride, you know, when yeah. you're up there. Uh, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's like there's pockets of air that we're just hitting, and by the end, we're like, oh, I'm kind of sick. <laughs> but it was cool. I, w I wonder, I'll have to ask my parents if they remember that trip differently, because I just remember the, the pilot, you know, making fun of my sister. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't remember, like, any turbulence or anything, nothing like that. <laughs> sure, sure. That's cool. LA, America's got some pretty cool stuff. I've been, yeah. I've been, I'm always like, I don't know, maybe it's one of those things like when you grow up in a certain area and you want to leave it and then other people come to your certain area. You know how it is? Mm -hmm. Like, and I feel like because I live in America, a lot of times I'm like, I need to go somewhere else and like, let's go to other countries, which is amazing. But it's also like, I forget how much cool stuff is here and like, I want to see it. Yeah, exactly. There's, that's, uh, that's why this summer I went. Uh, to New York for my internship because I yeah. all of my education has been in Georgia and I was like I need to I need to get out um, there's so much more <laughs> to see than the southeast and so everywhere I applied was basically cross-country sure. and this I got and it was it was beautiful and I'm like Georgia's not this pretty <laughs> 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 the where I was was like right on the St. Lawrence River and and like I said on the border to Canada and everything was just gorgeous up there and there is so much to see sure and i still i gotta make it out west i gotta make it out west did you do like all the crazy touristing things in new york times square statue of liberty stuff like that uh no i was where i was was actually about five hours from new york city um it's a good so excuse I was, 
Yeah, <laughs> I did go. Charlotte and I met in New York City actually for a short weekend. Cool. So we were there for I think I was there for two days, and I'd never been before. So we we packed a lot into that into that two days. We did Central Park. We did a Broadway show. We did like fun dinners. Um, we did the Met. Uh, we did we did nearly everything we could. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So what what play did you see? We saw Phantom of the Opera. Ooh, how was that? It it was great. It was it was so much fun. Um, I forgot how much I love that musical. And sure. just the, have you ever seen it on, on Broadway? I've seen the movie. Okay, because yeah. I'm a real fan. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that that's what I had seen before too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they've got the the chandelier. You know, like it's in the future, and they do the whole flashback. Yeah, and they have the chandelier on the stage, and right when the music comes up, it just like soars into the what? sky. It, it, so cool and of course they've got strobe lights going and and that theme is just so um loud and you know it just gives your head it was it was fantastic i loved it so cool i want to see a broadway yeah. show one day yeah no highly recommend yeah I'll, <laughs> we're done. I'll write it down yeah <laughs> <laughs> ryan you should really go see a broadway show uh, you know what i haven't thought about right. it until now but uh <laughs> i'm coming around <laughs> and is there is there one you really want to see uh, you know what? I would love to see Lion King. Yeah. You know, like the famous, like full on, I want, I saw like, uh, down here we have, they're called the Barber B Man mm-hmm. and they did Lion King and it was amazing. But I feel like something of that level of production would be really cool to see like on Broadway. But I'm pretty it much down be. to everything. I've been, I've been, uh, I saw The Greatest Showman and oh, I've yeah. been, dude, I've been like obsessed with it. It's weird. Yeah. The soundtrack is really good. Oh my god! I found out today that the Jenny Lind, you know, the like mm-hmm. famous singer over there, that's the actress and the singing voice are two different people. What? I feel betra- what? I feel betrayed. Oh my gosh! Yes. No. Yeah, the actress is not the woman singing; it's somebody else. Oh god, it's like when Zac Efron didn't sing in the first High School Musical. <gasps> right? I can't relate because I don't know what that means. But yes, exactly <laughs> like that. Yeah, I even wrote it down. Yeah, the actress is Rebecca something, Rebecca Ferguson, and the singer is Lauren Alred. My gosh. Two different people. So wow. kudo- kudos to the actress because I totally believed you were singing, but also you gotta, I feel okay. Yeah, exactly. It was weird because I, I really loved that movie. I loved all the musical numbers, but the the story itself just did not – I don't know. It didn't deliver. No, it didn't deliver for me at all. It was weird. The things they would bring up and then were get mentioned again. That's okay. (laughs) Relationships that just like happened with no context or anything. Um, I think I was too busy crying. Yeah. (laughs) But the musical (laughs) numbers, I was like, this is amazing. And and I've been listening to the soundtrack over and over again. Sure. Dude, same. I so I have never seen High School Musical, so what? I I didn't know Zac Efron could sing. What? How I'm, have you never? How old are you? I'm 26. How have you never seen High School Musical? Uh, <laughs> Any I'm, of them? I'm gonna say because I'm a boy, but that's not what I that's, mean. <laughs> that's not. I I know what you mean, but that's not a good reason because I feel like everyone at some point in their lives has seen High School Musical around our age group, even just as like a joke. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say it was a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the big thing in the first High School Musical that came out, very much like your revolution with The Greatest Showman, is that Zac Efron did not sing his role in the first movie. What? It was this other guy named Drew Seeley, and uh, he sang it. And at some point, they like blended their voices together, but it was never just Zac Efron. And it was this huge deal when High School Music 2 came out because it, everyone was like, it's Zac Efron. He's really singing in this movie. It was huh. a big deal. So he was like the, the Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, She's lip syncing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's so, so now strange. you'll have to go and listen to the soundtracks from High School Musical 1 and 2 and, Ooh, and hear the difference. That is, a, that is a tall order, Caitlin Pleasure. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> The really good song, the High School Musical franchise, all right? I'll just say it. High School Musical 2, you can skip, but, you know. I the mean, one where he's like, actually singing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sings in High School Musical 3, too. Oh, yeah, there's three of them, isn't there? Yeah, there's three of them. So, yeah, That's High School so Musical weird. 3 is really good. High School Musical 1 is a classic. High School Musical 2 is not the best. Yeah. 
<laughs> so strange he wouldn't sing because he's really good. Yeah, he is. I was very, very surprised. I like Hugh Jackman. I saw him in Les Mis, and I was like, all right, this man's got a voice. But in this one, I don't know. Maybe it just suited him better. I don't know. I really liked it. Yeah, I love their duet. Oh, you know, my when they're God. The yeah. Corfee in that scene was so great. It's the best. The best. <laughs> I loved it. So you, you've also been – now, you've been to Iceland. I've not been to Iceland. I have. I, I know people who've yeah. been there. Did you go in the winter to see like the Northern Lights, or were you there when there was no, none of that? We were. Charlotte and I went together in the mm-hmm. summer t- after we graduated from college. Mm-hmm. Um, it was. I I'm obsessed with Iceland. You got to be careful bringing it up because I'll just <laughs> good soar ahead. <laughs> That's why we're here, Caitlin. Welcome to the show. <laughs> well, I'll I'll tell you how I stumbled across Iceland cool. as if you know it's it's not like a whole country yeah. an island <laughs> yeah. itself. Um, <laughs> First, you found it in your room. <laughs> when I found it, <laughs> I discovered it. That's right. Um, I have this, this. I had this friend. She's still my friend in college, and we used to have lunch together a couple of days a week. And her family has traveled extensively. Like there are very few countries and places she has not been. And so one year we were like, you know what? We should go someplace really cool for New Year's Eve. Wouldn't that be so fun? You know, as if we had all of this excess money just oh, of lying around. Traveling's free. Wherever we wanted to go. And we were like, yeah, like, let's find a place to go. And so at the time I had a desk job at the information desk on campus. And so there's like no one there. Mm-hmm. And so I literally Googled best places to spend New Year's Eve. And Reykjavik was number two or three on the list. And Reykjavik's the capital wow. of Iceland. And I was like, where the heck is Reykjavik? <laughs> like, I've, I've never heard. <laughs> That's like, who, not real. <laughs> who is talking about Iceland? You know, I've never heard anyone talking about Iceland. This was back in 2014. Um, and I started researching Iceland at this desk job and became obsessed. I like it was a problem and <laughs> my friend Brittany who we had been talking about she was like I don't do cold weather and she was out <laughs> and <laughs> we also didn't have any money and then um basically the we graduated Charlotte and I both graduated and I got a job that was starting in about a month or so and we decided that we were going to go to Iceland and road trip across it because at this point I started sending Charlotte all of this research I had done on Iceland. Right. And we literally planned the trip in about a week and a half um, from the time we bought our plane tickets to when we actually left. Wow. It was, yeah, it, it was, I've never, it was very spontaneous, but very planned. It was strange. It was great. Respect. Um, yeah, it was, it's my favorite place I've been, I think. I really? want to go back. Yeah, I think it's it's an amazing country. You can't describe it, really. I mean, it's like another planet. Sure. I've heard expensive. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is expensive, <laughs> but so worth it. Um, so worth it. And it's, it's going through a lot of changes right now um, as it's becoming more touristy. Sure. Um, like a lot. Like when we were there, it was kind of right before it really became super popular and you know, you would travel for days and see no one on the road with you. I remember we got to the end of our trip and there were three cars behind us on the road and we were like, what is this traffic? <laughs> and <laughs> how did you find this place? <laughs> yeah. And I remember we traveled, we took like a four hour detour at one point to go see this waterfall and you get to the top of this waterfall where you're basically traveling on a dirt road where you have to use four wheel drive or else you can't get to the waterfall. Wow. And there's one sign there are no handrails, no steps, no parking, like nothing like that. But it's a tourist site. Um, it's crazy. But all of that like infrastructure has started to be built up now and changes your experience of the place. Because when we went, it's like, oh, like most of this country is so wild and you can go wherever you want. And sure. you know, it's one with nature. And it's, it's not so much like that anymore from my understanding. But still – you gotta go. <laughs> Twist my it's arm. It's amazing. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm I'm of the mind that I want to see everything. Mm-hmm. So any place that I haven't been, I'm like, all right, on the list. Yeah, definitely put Iceland at the top of your list as soon as you can because it's only going to keep changing. Of course. And uh, more things are going to become off limits as they like learn how to deal with tourist demands. That makes sense. So yeah. <laughs> 
still is. Um, when kids were studying like Pokemon cards, I was studying mummies <laughs> and what they looked like. Um, and so it, it's really, it's been something that's been around since before I can remember really. And I went to college thinking I was going to become an ethologist and like took classes with that in mind. And, you know, I just realized I didn't actually really like archaeology as a, as a career. <laughs> Sure. And uh, Egyptology, I was like, well, I can either like actually be out in the field or I'm going to be a professor probably. And it just seemed a little limiting in that vein. And so I, I kind of shifted gears to historic preservation, which is a little more practical, a little bit more hands-on, um, a little more local. <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, but that's, that. it's kind of always been there. So That's pretty cool. So yeah. the idea of loving history led to the preservation of it. Yes. Yes, exactly. Very interesting. Have you been to any like really crazy historical sites? Ooh, um, I mean Charleston's to... prehistoric. Yes, yeah, it's very historic. I did I did an internship in Savannah, Georgia, a couple years ago. Um, my the first like historic site I worked at that kind of started me down this path is a house museum in Atlanta called the Wren's Nest. And um, I won't go into its whole history, um, but sure. basically it's the it's the historic home of Joel Chandler Harris, which do you know who Joel Chandler Harris is? I'm about to. You are. Uh, it's like your history lesson for the day. Yes. You got to learn about Iceland. Now you'll get to learn about Joel Chandler Harris. But uh, Joel Chandler Harris was the compiler of the Brer Rabbit stories. Oh, so like okay. Brer Bear, Brer Rabbit, Tar Baby, all of that stuff. He compiled um, and it, his home in Atlanta. And the like the the intersection of so many things throughout history, both like racial history, literature, um, Atlanta history. They, there are a lot of crossovers that happen in this one place in this house, and it was it was endlessly interesting for me. And I was like, wait a second, this is a whole field I can get into. Um, and that place has just always continued to fascinate me. And it, like I said, it was kind of the the impetus for me going into this field. So it kind of holds a special place in my heart. Sure. Sure. So, uh, that's so cool. This is my, this is my favorite thing. And I say this almost every show about this show specifically is people are so different. And if you have different ambitions and different passions, it's so cool. Like when I found out that Ashley Eckstein as a kid wanted to be like a Supreme court justice, I was like, yeah. what? what? That's so cool. Yeah, it's so unexpected. Yeah. It's just not how you see her. And then you learn something like that, and it just adds a whole other layer to who she is. Yeah, same with you. History yeah. preservation <laughs> is like a really, really important thing that not a lot of people are openly into, it seems. It is. Not a lot of people know what it is either. So I know I it's... didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that if you – you don't notice it on surface level when you're in a place, but if it wasn't there, uh, your your outlook on life would be very different. Sure. Um, I've been reading this book uh, recently about like the environment, which is basically everything that you're in, and it talks a lot about how we spend 90% of our lives in an environment that is constructed by someone else. Someone Ooh. else is making the decisions about how you experience the world. Sure. And so it's important that the people doing those things are doing it mindfully. And the buildings that we're choosing to construct are um, constructed with a purpose and with function for the environment that they're in, while also taking into consideration the things that came before. That is amazing. Yeah, it, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, that's Makes I've sense. never thought about it that way, and it's wow. incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those history is written by the winners kind of thing. Yes, that's mm -hmm. exactly. amazing. Yeah. What? Yeah. So, like, yeah. wow. Okay, so do you have interest in as far as history? Is there a specific type of history vein that you enjoy, as in like, is it the history of events, or is it like history as in like physical history? Like this house was built by this person through this, versus this battle occurred here during this. Mm. Or just history in general, you're into all. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about preservation is that it encompasses a lot of different things and a lot of different time periods. Right. And it's a lot about understanding how all of these years and layers place create what you're looking at in front of you now. Right. And kind of understanding how all of those things and people and decisions come together into the building or the district or the city that you're looking at. 
And I think that's what's really fun about about the field is that you you get to understand how how a place can be imbued with meaning and with purpose because of the people who have occupied it and altered it and kind of left something of themselves in it. Sure. And you yeah, so it's not any period and, and that's the fun thing too is that you get to kind of cycle through these different periods of time. You're not kind of stuck with one thing. Sure. So what exactly, if you could, define historical preservation? Like, what is that <laughs> to you? It's hard. Like you said, it's so broad, and there's so many different avenues. Yeah. But like, to, I mean, like, for you specifically, if you're doing the job that you're setting out to do as a historical preservationist, however, whatever word I'm looking <laughs> that's not a word. That's the, It's a word now, and that's your job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. close, close. Yes. Just a preservationist, what, so you got it. What would it. that job entail? Um... I'm asking the hard ones here. Yeah, you are. Um, I think, like, in a, if I were to envision my dream job, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years down the line, I think it'd be really fun to be a consultant for different historic sites and specifically how um, helping them with interpretation and site interpretation and um, helping them decide how they're going to present the history that they have to the public. Because it's a, it's something we talk about a lot in my in my course is how we know what we know and how and why we're telling the things we're telling the public about what we know. Um, it's important the things that a site chooses to include in its history to you, and also perhaps even more importantly, what it chooses to not tell you. Sure. Um, and it's I think that I think there's a really big push lately to start talking about kind of the negative history and, and of specific local sites, whereas 10, 15 years ago, people really shied away from that. And uh, now it's a lot more about acknowledging that the past isn't perfect. The people in the past aren't perfect. And let's talk about that. And, uh, you know, you can't. You can't look at only the positive things or only the negative things. Because um, in history, we have a tendency to, like, write people off as good or bad um, pretty pretty easily. And you can't do that. There, People are complex, and you have to be able to, to see both sides of who a person was based on what we have left of them. Absolutely. That's so cool. <laughs> wow. I could just sit with that information. That's, yeah. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been talking a lot about um, Confederate monuments is a big hot right oh, now. Sure. Um, so it's something, you know, a lot of people have to deal with kind of how we solve these problems in as far as like having these these hate groups like Nazis and, and the KKK around and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a problem that's about so much more than a Confederate monument. You know, like the, the monument is just the placeholder for, for what the problem really is. Sure. But as preservationists, that's our job is to think about what to actually do with the physical monument right um, right that so makes it, sense yeah it's, it's been really interesting and there's no good answer to it no right answer i think um i know a lot of people probably disagree with that but um i think you owe it to i don't know it's hard to describe but on one hand you don't want to exalt the negative things of the past but on the other hand like these are a part of our history too and so it's learning how to balance what you do with certain monuments and whether mm -hmm. you choose to destroy them or move them somewhere else or keep them in the place they were um it's a lot goes into it and a lot is about understanding how and why the monument that specific monument got put up in the first place it's not the same for everyone and mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a lot it's a big job and it, it's really interesting and it's in a weird way, it's kind of exciting to start having these conversations with people. And I think the public now is really starting to understand how the landscape of a place really does impact you personally. Sure. I totally agree with that. That's a, yeah. That makes your job really, really important. Yeah. Because of yeah, what, like, <laughs> it's true. Because when you think about history and, like, a lot of people want to just put the the negative away and only show the positive, but... That's not life. And in order to, you can't forget the past. You have mm -hmm. to learn from it. And if you don't acknowledge the past, you can't own it as you should. Even if whole things happened, you still have to own that and then grow from it and use it as an example of what not to be as yeah. opposed to denying it ever happened. Yep, exactly. And and the question you have to ask too is, is having a monument of something like a better memorial, is that the best way to learn about our past? Right. Right. And it, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you have to, to have that dialogue and 
you have to be inclusive of everyone who's going to intersect with that monument. For sure. Um, and sometimes you can't do that. Like sometimes it's just not possible. And but you have to to try to make it possible whenever you can. Right. Uh, so and and I think it's cool too because a a lot of people like we have um, Athens has one, two Confederate monuments mm -hmm. um, in our downtown area. Um, they're very different from ones like where, that are in, um, that were in Charlottesville. Um, right. But no one, it's one of those things that you just walk by every day and you don't really even notice it. And then now everyone's like, oh, wait a second. Yeah. Athens has a current <laughs> monument. That, what's that about? <laughs> right. What did that guy yeah. fight for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a... Uh, it's, what it's an a, interesting time, time to be alive. Yeah, it is. It really is. And, so. and in the sensational lister that we have, everything is mm -hmm. fueled by emotion. Whereas, yeah. like, preservation is more of an intellectual pursuit. It's like we, mm -hmm. ha we have to... That's... Wow. That's amazing. It is. Yeah, a lot of people are... like. Uh, there are a lot of preservationists who are just immediately like, no, take, take everything down. Um, right. And then some who... Um, I won't get into it, but like our, our monument that we have here is, mm -hmm. it was, there are different waves of Confederate monuments. I don't know if you know, I do um, not. but the first wave was built kind of immediately following the civil war and they're very mortuary in theme. So like the one we have is an obelisk, um, okay. which is, I'm not, I'll explain things to you if you know what it is, just stop no, me. But an obelisk do. is um, like the Washington monument is an obelisk. Um, an obelisk, and that is like a funerary motif. You put it up for grave sites and things like that. You'll see them a lot in graveyards. Right. And uh, so the one we have is this huge obelisk mourning the loss of the Confederate sons, brothers, and fathers. Um, and then you have another wave that kind of started in the 19, um, in the 20th century. So like during the laws um, of Jim Crow and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when you start seeing these uh, like Robert E. Lee on the horse, like very confident and um, romanticizing the lost world of the old South. And right. then you have another wave that starts coming up in the 1960s and 50s during like the civil rights era. And so those monuments have a very different tone and a very different purpose than the ones from like the 1870s and 1860s right, um, right. and you have to decide like if those ones from the 1860s are just as bad as the ones from the 1960s and maybe they are right um, but that's the discussion that you you have to have and maybe they aren't you know so wow. it's a it's a lot of fun it's very interesting it's never boring yeah i didn't know any of that mm -hmm. that's yeah. really neat it makes sense yeah because yeah. even given the context of the time in which they were erected because very different context Mm -hmm. As like what is going on in the 1960s, whereas like desegregation's right around the corner, and that's when you choose to monument to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, that's very very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people will say, you know, it's a it's a coincidence that those things are going on at the same time. It's not. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a really interesting coincidence. It's, <laughs> it's not. Decisions like that are very specific. Um, that's the thing I've really learned in this program is that the way our environment is constructed is very specific. Very few things are done flippantly and, and without a lot of thought. And sometimes the thought is we're saving money and not putting any thought into this. Um, right. But recognizing that, that's, that, that, that that was the purpose behind why a building looks the way it does is, is important too. Right, right. Wow. Man. So what, uh, what classes go into getting uh, the education needed to do this? Um, well, you pretty much have to have a master's. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, but as far as like specific classes, it looks like a lot of different things. There are some programs that are really geared towards uh, like materials conservation. So like learning how to um, like fix brick masonry on, you know, a 200 year old house, um, like very like science based. Sure. Um and that's not my program. <laughs> I, that would not be my forte. I don't have the patience for that. Um, right. Whereas my program is more like setting up more for like managerial of like sites and um, working with historic sites and in government um, positions really is what a lot of people end up doing right out of my program mm -hmm. um, and more like theory based and talking about things like site interpretation and, and how we how we talk to the public about history, um, which is what I was always interested in. So. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're yeah. like you're like the the guardians of the wills, passing on the knowledge. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh my gosh, you just made my day. I love that. <laughs> this is why I'm here. 
<laughs> wow, thank you so much. <laughs> of course, of course. When I found out you were into history, I was like, all right, sweet, this is going to be great. Because, I, I, mean, I mean, obviously the first thing that comes to my mind is Indiana Jones. Belongs in a museum, you know. Yeah, and, sometimes uh, it doesn't, though. Uh, right? But I've learned. <laughs> it's crazy. Sorry, go on. No, I love it. Like, I love having people on that are different because different is interesting, mm -hmm. you know. And like I said before, I mean, it's really, really important that you're doing this because especially I feel like our generation, it's the cool thing to not care about anything. You know, mm -hmm. and that's just like the way to go about it. And with this specific path that you're picking, a lot of care. You have to care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're caring yeah. about like the bigger picture and its effect on humanity, essentially, and that's a big undertaking. So God, I like how you talk about my field. It makes me feel very good. Like, I, yes, I am doing something. <laughs> you are, and someone who had no idea uh, just an hour ago, thank you because that's awesome. Well, thank you for listening. I for I sure. get on the soapbox quite yes. frequently about it. Th that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you do you have a dream? dream place you'd like to go for the historical like bit of it like, um what, is it egypt i feel like it's egypt yeah i i mean yeah egypt's always been number one uh it has to be right yeah it has to be it's 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 quite sad and now i can be kind of i can laugh a little bit about it but right the plan was always that i was going to go to egypt for my high school graduation that uh. was kind of always the plan and, and I kid you not Brian in 2011 the day I graduated high school the next day is when revolution broke out in Egypt oh, and it like no. suddenly became a very unsafe place to go I was yeah like, why is this happening <laughs> that sucks and they're just like trashing things right it, it was like did, just yeah. destroying historical sites of everything down there yeah, Man, yeah, what, yeah. I mean, what a bummer. thankfully, I, I think that um, Egypt in like the early 2000s, mm -hmm. the Egyptian people started to get a lot more appreciation for their ink past because it, it hasn't always been there. Right. And so I think they, I would like to think that they have taken a little bit more care, even in the tumultuous times that they're in right now. But yeah, it's uh, a little it's bit, a little bit of soft spot. I understand. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like, it'll happen one day. Yeah, I'm not of course. Worried. I feel the same way about like Tunisia. I'm like, Is oh. that your place? I mean, Tatooine, right? It'd be kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, but yeah. then you're like, mm, I don't know if it would be right now. The the whole area, like, mm, wait till it settles yeah. down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That's the thing. I would, I would go to Egypt tomorrow if someone was like, hey, I'm going. I got a ticket. You want to go? Of course. And then you're in like one of those planes with like chickens in the back. Yeah, <laughs> my parents are like absolutely not, and I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm here already, so sorry. That's right, too late. I'll see you in a little bit, or not, yeah. and then just hang up. <laughs> no, I'd, no, I wouldn't do that. But <laughs> probably, probably best, probably best. You don't want to shut your lifelines. Yeah, the problem is no one. I, I don't know if I'd want anyone to go to Egypt with me, like I do, but I would just be a hot mess the whole time because. Right. Like, I mean, it's your moment. Star yeah. I mean, like for as much as I love Star Wars, that's how much like the way I can talk about Star Wars, I can talk that way about ancient Egypt um, and even more so in some places. I mean, I named my dog Ramesses after an Egyptian oh, pharaoh. Awesome. Like, it's pretty serious. Like, I, <laughs> you know, we talk about how people like when someone says they're a Star Wars fan and you got to gauge like what they really mean by that. Oh, yeah. Um, that's how when people are like, oh, I'm interested in ancient Egypt, too. I'm like, let's let's talk about that. Let's figure yeah. out what you really mean there. Um, I am with you there. I like Star Wars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Which movies don't you like? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of gauge it. You're like, I like Egypt. What do you like? Uh, King, like King Tut. Yeah. And I'm like, well, let me give you a, a really detailed history of why King Tut doesn't actually matter. Like, let's <laughs> let's talk this through. Let's do it. Like, Steve you want the Martin backstory? I can otherwise. give you the backstory. <laughs> Dude. I'm like, what, like, wait, <laughs> what, what is it about Egypt that, like, got you? Do you I know. I no, I really don't know. Um, I Just have everything. this. Yeah, I have this notebook actually from kindergarten where we would color in it every morning. And there is a picture of a pyramid in it. Um, that says Egypt, like in my five-year-old handwriting. Um, what? Yeah, it's crazy. My mom actually framed for me one year as like this, like That's nice awesome. reminder to like follow your dreams, kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and 
no one that's the thing like no one knows where it started from it's just always been there literally since i was five years old so what it's uh, yeah it's crazy um, that. yeah I, I love that because i <laughs> i so here's a lot of people that i talk to i would say possibly even a majority specifically our generation uh they don't know what they want to do for a very long time Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of whatever. Oh, just try this, try this, try a ton of different things. And it is, I mean, it is whatever, right? But there are very few yeah. people, like myself included, and you as well, that like something just clicked from a very, very young age. And the fact that it came to fruition as mm-hmm. an adult, I think is amazing. Like I just I just had uh, Ryan yeah. Donahoe on from the Force Cast. I had Ryan on and he was telling me about how – uh he worked for ESPN for a while and Sports Illustrated. He's really, really into sports. And in it, he talked about how when he was five years old, he had one of those like karaoke machines and he would like record interviews of him like talking about sports. And then as he grew Gosh. up, he worked for ESPN interviewing LeBron James about sports. Like, it's so cool. And you at like five are writing Egypt on pyramids. And now you're a preservationist. What? Feels good. Thank you. That's so cool. Fun. That is so cool. It's yeah. What? Like I'm I have to like sit with this information. That's a really big deal. I love what you're doing. I think the story's amazing. So I can't have half of Sky Talkers on my show without talking a little Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. We got to. Right. Right. First off, congrats on one year. Thank you so much. It's a a big deal. It is. I I can't. I I literally can't believe it. That sounds so Valley Girl, but I literally can't believe it. Just can't Um, even. I just can't even, guys. Right. Come on. Yeah. It's. Uh, Yeah. Looking back at everything we've done this past year and how many people we've gotten to meet and it's just so insane like i remember seeing you at the dorky diva meetup at celebration but i like didn't know like i knew you didn't know who we were and i was like we're just here to say hi to savannah and now i wish that we had like talked that day because that would have been so great right which is so weird because i totally knew who you were (laughs) i found you guys from uh i think it was savannah's podcast when you guys had her on i was like oh my my friend savannah's on a show (laughs) <laughs> and then you guys immediately became my favorite Star Wars podcast. Like, oh, that's, that's hands so down. Nice of you. <laughs> hands down. And I listen to a lot of that. But <laughs> I, I absolutely love your show, and I'm very vocal about it. Yes, um, thank you. It's it's so kind. Um, well. Yeah. It's, oh, Savannah was actually our very first guest that we had. Yes. Um, so it was, it was great. In 2018, you're going to be on the show, too. So You let me just, know. I'm a yeah. resident Qui-Gon expert. Yeah. So. Uh, I was wondering when we were going to get into Qui Gon. <laughs> I mean, it's it's inevitable. <laughs> I've to- I've told anyone I was like, talk to me for five minutes about Star Wars. You are guaranteed to get some Qui Gon out of me. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's my dude. But your dude, uh, Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. Oh, I yeah, know. he's got my heart. <laughs> I know, which is fair. You you're uh, out of the OT. You like six best, correct? I do. As yeah. Do I? As yeah, do I? It's, it's so it's, good. It's so good. It's, I mean, the whole first sequence on Tatooine, it just, right. it grips me every time. I can't right. get enough of it. It's dude, so good. Everyone talks about, like, I love aliens, and everyone's mm-hmm. always like, oh, the cantina. I was like, dude, Jabba's Palace. Jabba's Palace. R2 yeah. with the drinks on him. It's right. so great. And Lando's disguise is, like, one of my favorite oh. costumes in all of Star Wars. Yeah, that one is great. Oh, Return of the Jedi is actually one of those movies I, I try not to watch as much so that it... I don't know. It's, like, it's still like a surprise, and there are little details I miss, and I really – it's one of those ones I, I don't watch as often because I still – I don't know. I just – I still want it to retain some of that unknown mystique, even though I know how the movie goes. Sure. I mean, it's weird, but <laughs> – that's, that's amazing that you're capable of enjoying things in moderation because I, <laughs> I, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually what like my my little bio thing says on the Dorky Diva page. It's like oh, Brian, really? Brian's a guy who doesn't know how to enjoy things moderately, <laughs> and that is a fact. I am all or nothing, and uh, Star so Wars funny. is very much all. 
Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I get that. As, as a fellow uh, Luke Skywalker fan, now I have to admit I did like Han better in the OT uh, across okay. three, but I love Luke in Episode Six because Jedi are my thing. Mm-hmm. And then we get Episode Eight. Now, yes. what to you was the most shocking thing about Luke specifically in Episode Eight? Def- definitely the revelation with Ben. Yeah, um, same. I remember the first time I saw that, it, like hitting Charlotte in the arm. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what is happening? Nope. Uh, nope. 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 Yeah. <laughs> now that I've the first thing is the last Jedi begs to be watched more than once, and 100%. yeah, and so in subsequent viewings, it's it's made more sense to me. I'm okay with it now. Um, I'm really okay with it now. I think it was the the best choice for Luke's character, honestly. Sure. Um, it's still, it's so hard to, to cool. grapple with the fact that he's not here anymore. With you. Um, and yeah, I can't think about that scene too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> same, same, same. Yeah. But I think, I think it just makes so much sense. And then episode eight was such a, like such a calling out fandom for what it is. Yeah. Um, and like hitting it over the head with things like that. And, thing is we built luke skywalker up m- me and and even so much so the fans that like literally grew up with luke skywalker in the 70s and 80s sure. to be this mythic hero of mythic proportions and at the end of the day he's just a man yeah. and I, I love how how ryan brought that back to reality and still he ended on on a hero's note right um he remembered so I, himself I, yeah, I thought it was great, and yeah, he realized that like his part in this story is, is over, and I think that's I loved it. Same, you know, you know how I help myself sleep at night. How? <laughs> how I justify it because I'm like it's it's still Luke, it's still Luke because you don't want mm-hmm. like a full departure, you know, from the mm-hmm. character. Because uh, as Star Wars fans, I mean, we're pretty we're pretty fragile when it comes to <laughs> our Star Wars. You don't say. Yes, <laughs> and what got me was. Uh, so with episode eight, there are words that I think are very, very specific. Like they, mm-hmm. they use a word for a very specific purpose. They're not just saying, oh, these are the words I've chosen. No, no, no. Each word means something. And when he says for a brief moment at like out of pure instinct, he turned the lightsaber yeah. on. I was like, so mm-hmm. it, it wasn't even like a conscious decision. Like they, they played it off. Like, okay, he's looking at Ben. He's like, you know what? I think I'm going to do this. Should I do this? Yeah, I'm definitely going to do this and then turn it on. Not what happened. He nope. saw the vision and like got scared for a second, turned the lightsaber on, and just in horrible timing, that's when Ben looked up. Yeah. So I was like, okay, yeah. it wasn't even like Luke was like, I'm going to kill my nephew. No, he saw total darkness. It was like, oh, God, lightsaber went on, and it just looks really, really bad from Ben's perspective. Yeah. You know? that, yeah. So, so I was like, I okay, love... that's, how, that's yeah. how I, I, I – keep myself calm <laughs> yeah i i mean it, it makes sense and, and so much too of what i've been thinking about now is that maybe like luke misconstrued what he actually saw in ben's mind because ray says later you know your mistake was in thinking that the decision was made it sure. wasn't um and so you know that snoke was kind of manipulating that situation too i think is mm-hmm. a possibility and um, there's no denying that kylo was being tempted and to some level like heavily manipulated by Snoke at that point, but you know, the decision wasn't made yet. Right. And what happened with Luke was like Luke says afterwards, I love that line. You know, I was left with shame and consequence. Yeah. Um, as you see, like that line just hits me so hard every time. It sucks. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, a moment, a moment of like, Oh God, turned it on and it ruined everything. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like, you know, that that moment is just culmination of, of things that have been happening that we don't get to see. Sure. Uh, So it's like, they've been sensing this tension between each other, Luke and Kylo and, or Ben. um, Mm -hmm. And that this is just, it all coming to head. And uh, I love the episode three nods in this one. Like that one specifically, uh, it's very much Palpatine twisting Anakin. You know what I mean? So, you know, Snoke was like, you know, Luke's going to turn against you one day. And he's like, no, 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 it's nothing. And then when the moment comes, it's like, look, Anakin, I told you the Jedi are taking over. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. very much reflective of that. And then when uh, Ben goes full dark side, you know, uh, I'm more powerful than the Chancellor. I can overthrow him. Then you and I can rule the galaxy and make things the way we want them to be. I was like, you straight up pulled an Anakin. And Ray's like, I can't do this. <laughs> like, You're breaking my heart. Oh, yeah. wait. That's Padme, not Ray. <laughs> yeah. And st- instead of that, we just get, don't do this. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, Ray absolutely made the right decision. Oh, um, it, it's real. crazy how similar those scenes are. I love it. Uh, yeah, it's it's. <laughs> I was, that was one of the things I was really worried about with the sequel trilogy was how it was going to rhyme with the original six because George Lucas is very specific in how these scenes and uh, motifs play throughout the saga. And mm. to be honest, it was like I was worried with Force Awakens just because it so heavily relied on nostalgia. And, yep. you know, it is what it is and it served its purpose and it's still a great movie. Yep. Um, but I was really happy with The Last Jedi and seeing like now that we're starting to get these high res um pictures and gifts and things like that starting to see people putting together these parallels is really exciting i love it i love it there was something that um like i personally i think george lucas is like one of the greatest artists of our time Mm -hmm. like i'm a a big george lucas fan for i mean a multitude of reasons but like most of all for an artist in a commercial setting to not care about the reception by fans is so ballsy because it's like you, the the point of a movie is to sell it. You know what I mean? You're trying to put your art out there, but it has to, it has to sell. Mm-hmm. And George Lucas got rich off the first one and was like, I'm pretty much going to do whatever I want. And the prequels are 100% him putting his art out there. And mm-hmm. then people hated Jar Jar. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to make him Senator. I'm going to make him give Palpatine the power to make the empire. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, so when Seven came out, I loved the characters, but the movie felt way too safe for me personally. Mm-hmm. And then when Eight came out, I was like, oh, my God, it's like George Lucas is back. Crazy, off the walls, just, like, amazing. And there was, yeah. a, there was a quote by Ryan Johnson, and he said, uh, George Lucas never wrote a Star Wars movie wondering what the fans will like. Yeah, and I was like, tweet. I was like, that's all I need. That's all I need. This guy, yes, lots of yes, Wow. And it's just so nuts. And the movie is just, I, I saw this meme. It was like J.J. Abrams set the table, you know, and it had it all looking nice and everything. And then Ryan Johnson comes in and just flips the table. And then J.J. Mm-hmm. comes back and he's like, what did you do? And it's like, this is pretty <laughs> much what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With J.J. doing seven, Ryan eight, and then J.J. back for nine. He's like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is from, and I mean, as you know, I am a huge like Kylo Ren fan as well. He's he's definitely in my top five favorite characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like I I know like seeing fan discourse about anything, and not just about Kylo Ren, but like assuming how a story is going to end um, in any capacity within the Star Wars world, and remembering that like JJ already has Episode Nine written. Like he sure. showed it to the story, like to um, Disney, like two days after the Last Jedi came out. Right. You know, like he's not like all of, everything that's happened has already happened. Right. Um, if, if you want like a really old Star Wars callback, this has all happened before and right. far, far away. Um, it's all like the story's already written, and the same was true with the Last Jedi too. You mm-hmm. know, Ryan was writing it before it came out. Yep. And he was responding to the things that he picked up on and that he thought were the most interesting threads in the in The Force Awakens. Um, and so, like, the whole, you know, Snoke theories and who Ray's parents are, like, for him, that wasn't important. And so it never played into how he wrote the story. Sure. It's, just, it's so interesting, I think. It is. It's, re- it's really interesting as well, like, the fandom, how it's, how it's divided once again. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if I said this on previous shows. I probably did, but I have a horrible memory, so I repeat myself a lot. Uh, but you know what? 36 episodes in, uh, my listeners have probably learned to deal. Anyway, uh, it, what's interesting is like, so I grew up loving the prequels, right? I love mm-hmm. the originals. I love the prequels because the prequels were the backstory to the originals that I already loved. Mm-hmm. And that's why episode three is actually my favorite Star Wars movie of all of them because it was like this perfect final piece. And I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. everything makes sense now. And it's been interesting to see people that love the originals hated the prequels and then they loved episode seven right you're like okay this makes sense it's like a pretty four it's very familiar very similar and then episode eight comes on and that's where the divide is because the people who hated the prequels and loved seven who also loved eight are having a really hard time with the people who hated the prequels loved episode seven and hate episode eight and it's been so this strange. weird sort of divide. And people are like, oh, my God, like, how can you not love this way? I was like, dude, people have been hating on my Star Wars my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been so interesting that this it's... movie is like the one that broke because it was so off the walls. It's and it's so great. strange. It's... it's so strange. And the, and that's the thing, too, like thinking about as someone who thinks about 
time a lot in, in history and how things are perceived, like how this movie will age once it's outside of the fan discourse. Yeah. Like very much how we talk about the original trilogy now and how we're starting to talk about the prequel trilogy too. Yeah. Um, and being able to like, I feel like now fan discourse is finally being able to start to start looking at these films as a complete saga and not as these like individual trilogies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, however they do choose to end this trilogy, the sequel trilogy, how the problems that we're obsessing over in the last Jedi will be seen as like, you know, the best thing Ryan Johnson could have done for star Wars, or maybe even the worst thing. I don't think that'll be the case, but how everyone will be like, wow, it was so unexpected in the last Jedi. And isn't that so great? And, and in 30 years, aren't going to care that, Snoke never got a backstory because like it's part of their mythology like Snoke never had a backstory you know like how we've always known that Vader was Luke's father yeah it'll be like something like that like Snoke's never had a theory a backstory so they're never gonna care right right it's so interesting and and like given what I'm now calling the emperor defense on <laughs> Snoke I'm like think about it they did the exact same thing like episode four Vader's like the baddest man in the galaxy in episode five you found out he has a boss and you're like what and he mm -hmm. shows up as a hologram. And then episode six, he can use force lightning, which you've never seen before. And then they kill him off. Yeah. Like, that's the same thing they did with Snoke. Think about it. Yep. Yep. It I is. Lo I love it. That, it is. that, that, uh, also as a history buff, we got to see books. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my favorite scene of the entire movie is the Yoda scene. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really good. my God. Cause it, there's so many little things as a, uh, a, um, historian of the Jedi, if you will. I'm a, the Jocasta new. The Jocasta new, yes, yes. The Bro Costa new. Um, <laughs> uh, again, you got me again. <laughs> yes, the whole idea. Like I'm, I, you'll see me debate all the time. I'm like, the Jedi don't need to end. You don't understand. Like they got, they they got, they lost their way. But to mm. heck, Qui Gon, <laughs> who was around during the time of the fall of the Jedi, was the only Jedi that got it right. So much so that he was the first one to become one with the Force and retain his identity and come back as a Force ghost. I was like, that's the thing. That's the thing. And this movie was so subtle in how it like proved that the Jedi don't need to end. And like, I mean, Yoda straight up like lights the tree on fire and is just calling Luke dumb the whole scene, which is yeah. amazing. He's like, you're being really yeah. dramatic. Yeah. And like so much so, he says that. You know, there's nothing in the library that the girl Ray doesn't already possess, knowing full well she has the books she has already. The books, yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> Yoda, you're the best. And then, and then he like, and then he sits with Luke, like Luke. You know, he's being dramatic. Comes off the explosion, and then he's like, "So it is time for the Jedi to." And Yoda's so petty with Luke that he's like, "Time it is," and lets him sit for a minute, thinking he agreed with him. And then he's like, "For you to look past a pile of old books." It's like, yep. oh, wow, look at that. It's like the Jedi don't need to end. What, what? And then Brian's happy. <laughs> they just needed, like, a come to Jesus yeah, meeting. Exactly. Like, they just look, needed, like, is... oh, we should start looking at people and not rules. Yeah. Huh, crazy. Interesting. <laughs> That's why Qui-Gon was a maverick. <laughs> <laughs> Even Obi-Wan's like, Qui-Gon, listen, if you just, like, pay attention and, like, listen for a minute, you'd be on the council. And Qui-Gon's like, I got no time for that. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love it. Yeah. But yeah, it's so weird how everything is so switched in The Last Jedi, but everything still like for me anyway, my interpretation is like sure. throwing away these these for me like petty things that don't really matter. Like sure. who Ray's parents are and the Snoke theory. And I know for a lot of people that stuff really did matter and so I don't want to try and discredit that. Sure. Um for me that's never been the most interesting story. Same. For me the most interesting story was always Kylo and Ray from the beginning and so as that fan, I got really good payoff in The Last Jedi when oh, yeah. that just happened to be the thing that Ryan thought was the most interesting, too. Mm -hmm. um, but then even at the core of it, like, you know, like, Ray asking about what the Force is. Like, she is fandom in that moment. <laughs> yeah, right. I, the <laughs> best what joke is... of the whole movie is with the, yeah. the leaf. <laughs> yeah. That's and Luke, like, they, <laughs> Luke basically gives her this, like, Obi-Wan speech. And then, again, she's like, but what is it? And yeah. then all of us were like, okay, we know the speech, but what is it? Um, it's but it so still, good. like, holds really true these, what I think of these, like, core themes of Star Wars of, like, family and friendship and redemption and, like, having compassion for someone else. Absolutely. Um, it really hammers those themes home, like, getting to the core of what Star Wars is and kind of getting rid of all of this fluff that has built up over the past 40 years. Sure. It's almost like Qui-Gon had it right or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll save it for Sky Talkers. <laughs> I t- have a Qui Gon episode, and I will I will bring you women to the light. Listen, Brian, I don't know if I can have a whole episode on Qui Gon. <laughs> you can't. Nobody can but me. I have the copyright. The thing is, I I don't dislike Qui Gon. I just remember viewing the Phantom Menace in a very different light um, when it's we were okay. doing our our machete series. And, oh, I and remember. Yeah. <laughs> I've listened to every show, Caitlin Pleasure. The real reason I brought you on. <laughs> I figured it was probably was on some level, let's 100%. be honest. <laughs> yeah, this history stuff, I was like, eh, it's okay. We need to set this thing waiting. straight. Just waiting. <laughs> Eventually, we'll talk about Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, Let I guess. Let her long enough for her to feel comfortable, and then... Exactly. Lull you, lull you into a false sense of security. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. You listen here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly the thing well again it's like with Qui-Gon he's a complex character Very. he's not perfect um nope. but he has a lot of he has a lot of good and necessary qualities mm. for the day and, and for his relationship with Anakin but mm. with things like his relationship with Padme it kind of falters there for me sure. um, but then we see him in the Clone Wars and with um Obi-Wan and with Yoda it's these really great scenes and get Liam Neeson to do it again and it's fantastic um, it's okay yeah it's like you you can see both for sure. For you know, sure. Yeah, and I think that's as a Kylo Ren fan, that's like one of the things <laughs> that's been an uphill climb with fandom lately, but it's okay. <laughs> that's all right. It'll it'll yeah. all it'll all settle. Episode it'll, nine's gonna be bumped. Yeah, you know, whatever happens, it's it's been a crazy ride, that's for sure. That's right. That's right. As has this podcast. Yes, yes. And with that, thank you so much for coming on. This was thank really you. fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and like listening to me ramble. I appreciate it. <laughs> right? I had a really good time. This was super fun. Yeah, I know it was. It absolutely was. So I forgot my last guest, so I'm gonna I'm gonna remember with you. Where can people find you online? Yes. So you can find me on Twitter at Caitlin Plusher. That's C A I T L I N P L E S H E R. Um, and then you can find me on uh, my podcast Sky Talkers, which on Twitter we're at Sky Talkers Pod, or you can head on over to our website skytalkers.com. That's right, and I cannot recommend that show enough. It's my fave. <laughs> Thank you. It's so good. And uh, to, uh, ho ho to use your and Charlotte's phrase, so good. <laughs> do, do, do we say that a lot? <laughs> I mean, maybe a couple times. <laughs> It's great. Okay. Well, it's been so good. (laughs) That's right. And...